Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well on this Monday evening for Operations Week night class. I hope that Operations Week was good to you, that it made sense, that it was digestible enough. I feel like there was a lot of information in there and to all but the incredibly um, operationally geeky of you, um, it might be a bit overwhelming. Um, but like we said, a lot of it is academic in terms of health and safety and just getting all your paperwork in order and everything. It's just literally going through, ticking it off, ticking it off and not being overwhelmed by it. Um, the equipment conversation is a whole nother subject and one that you can spend a lifetime getting your head around. Um, so we're trying to speed up that process a little bit for you. First of all, by bringing Joel Bowen in for the expert speaker video last week. I wonder who's watched the whole thing through. I loved it. I found it absolutely fascinating. And um, I hope that you did too. I mean, that video alone has got gold nuggets after gold nuggets. So hold that close to you as you get your business off the ground. Um, so this week, we have got two guests. And we're going to do a few different things. So grab a pen and paper if you like taking notes. Um, obviously, you can watch this back, but it's pretty good to just kind of like have your mind in gear while you're going through this because there's going to be a lot of technical stuff. Um, we're going to start with Ollie Hunter, who was our head of development at Curb and also head of market. So he's very well versed in operational and tech information. He's going to do a presentation on some key tech tips that you should know to try and get your systems down and things running a bit more smoothly as you embark upon this uh, very challenging um, challenge. Um, and then we are going to bring in Nick Friedman, the godfather of street food, he likes to call himself. And um, me and him are gonna have a chat about operations. He's just very straight talking. He is machine-like in getting the best uh, route from A to B and doing it as quickly as possible um, and as, as effectively as possible. So we'll have a chat. And then the three of us are gonna go over the equipment list homework and just go through some of your um, spreadsheets and discuss them and hopefully it will really open up the conversation and the, your thoughts around what equipment you're getting whether it's all a great idea whether you've forgotten anything and then we're going to leave a good amount of time at the end to talk uh, to take questions so have your questions ready um, all these questions as well, like save them till the end, get them all ready. Um, there's a lot that you can get out of this session. Um, so yeah, tune in. Right. So I am going to let Ollie, I'm going to bring Ollie in now. Ollie, are you out there? I'm here. Hello. Hello, Ollie. Greetings from Haringey. Yeah, up in up near Finsbury Park. That's where I am. Lovely. Looks very um, atmospheric in there. Um, so, <laughs> what I just want to, I'm going to let you crack on and do your presentation, but um, Ollie was always at Curb known as the fixer. He, his whole MO is about finding an easier way of doing something so that he can free up more of his time to do other stuff. And I think it's a really good approach for everyone as they start businesses. What are the ways, what are the mechanisms, what are the systems that we can find to free up more time to do the other stuff? Here's Ollie to give you a bit of a rundown on some tech tips that will do that. I'll see you shortly. Thanks, P. Um, so yeah, there's a you know there's this like whole idea that if you want a job done well, you get someone who's really lazy to do it because they'll find the quickest way of doing it, and they'll find a way that they don't have to keep doing the same work. That has been my whole like mo since I've ever started work. Basically, I'm so lazy that I'd rather get a robot to do my work. My dream is in the future that uh, one day I just sit in my chair doing nothing with all the robots, just doing everything that I want, to, want them to be doing. So uh, I've split this tech tips uh, presentation into three different sections, um, kind of based similarly on the idea that you, you improve throughout your journey as a business. So the first one is tech newbie. So this is like the first things you should put in place as a brand new business. The easiest one being get a website. It sounds like a bit counterintuitive now because everyone has Instagram and people think that you can just use Instagram instead of having a website, but it's kind of still not the case. 
I was I was thinking the other day when if you've seen Million Pound Menu, uh, one of our old businesses, Barbecue Dreams, were on that. And they got a, lot, a ton of new Instagram followers, but, but they didn't have a website. So Curb's website had a huge spike in uh, visits because people still just Google the name of the business. And the way Google's algorithm works, if you're the official owner of the website, you'll go first. So get a website. You can use Squarespace. You can use Wix. Uh, there's one called Webflow, which is a bit more complicated, but um, it's quite good as well. And it's so easy. So this is one I made literally uh, 40 minutes ago <laughs> to get ready for this. And it's really simple. You just put in the details of your business, put some nice uh, photos in. And actually, I didn't do all of it. So it still refers to like a pickle company. But this is this is how you can make a nice looking website on Squarespace. And you can do it in an evening. Um, this is Lily from Ground. This is her business. This is the same platform this is still squarespace and this is how nice you can make uh, a website that's built on squarespace look so it's incredibly like functional and incredibly like expandable and you can do loads of stuff have a shop on it and everything so that would be my first recommendation go on somewhere like squarespace or wix get a website up and running then my next one is I find it a bit sad when I get an email from a, like a business name at gmail.com. When you sign up to Squarespace, you'll get a domain name like at Ollie's Taco, um, Ollie's Tacos com. You can uh, sign up through that and get a G Suite or I think it's called Google Workspace now. You can get a, an account with that and then you can just manage all your emails through um, through Gmail. And it's just the same as just having a Gmail account, but you have that at ollie'stacos.com domain name, which is, I know it's so minor, but it makes you feel more legit. And it, it's a big thing. Obviously, pretty much everyone in the world has WhatsApp. Get that, great for communicating with your customers and your team. Create a little group for your team in there. Um, the one thing I, I've never seen yet, and I still, I've said this every time I've done a talk about like, like this, why don't you create a group, invite your customers into the group, and then you can talk directly to your customers? If you have people who are uh, like ambassadors for you because they keep coming to the to your uh, restaurant or your street food stall, um, add them in there, and then just tell them when you're where you are where you're going to be. Send them deals, all that kind of stuff. There's there's so much potential about creating a WhatsApp group. At the start of the first lockdown in March last this basically this time last year. Um, Jonathan Downey created uh, created this whole hospitality union on the back of WhatsApp groups. He had like six or seven WhatsApp groups, all with 250 people in. And he was just forwarding messages to each one. And it was an incredibly quick, easy way of like getting this uh, like group of hospitality people together and uh, trying to create action to help the hospitality industry. So definitely do that. Social media, we talked about this in the marketing week. Sit down and plan your posts. Get an Excel spreadsheet, write it all down, put loads of uh, pictures in. Definitely do that. And then really simply get iZettle or Square and you can start taking card payments straight away. I would say on the whole, well, right now, probably 95% of all transactions in street food or anything like that are card. A lot of uh, companies, a lot of markets have now totally banned cash, and so it's all uh, cashless. So you need to have it. IZettle and Square are basically the two best ones. Which one is better? Maybe IZettle slightly, but it's not that big a deal. You can just go with either. Go with one that you can buy a replacement reader with easily because they break quite easily. So that was stage one, tech newbie. That's you just starting off your business. You need these basic things in place. And then my my whole idea is that basically you're trying to use technology to minimize your workload. So like what Petra was saying, you want technology to sort of replace what you're doing. And if you were thinking you were going to hire someone to do something, is there a cheaper alternative, which is getting an app to do it or getting a some sort of program to do it? So my next stage is tech adult. This is the next level. Um, if you've got more than five people, it's probably a bit more complicated than just sending texts out about uh, who's going to be on your rotor when, working when. So you can get some really great, quite cheap um, rotor software, 
we use one at, we use one at Curb called Deputy, and then there's another one called Rotor Ready. And essentially, your team sign up, and then you basically book their calendar for them, and then you don't have to worry about people not knowing when they're working. Super simple. I, I reckon after about five people, you want to get something like that because it just takes away a lot of admin from you. And then you can use that to calculate how much they're paid and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to go into too much of that because that's a bit more complicated. This is another thing, another big bugbear of mine is that people think that Instagram followers or Facebook followers or Twitter followers actually equate to something that's sustainable. You don't own any of those platforms. You don't own any of those followers. If Facebook, if you'd spent ages working on a big Facebook group and you were influential five years ago, you're now probably not that influential because no one uses Facebook as much as they did five years ago. And the exact same thing will happen to Instagram. The exact same thing happened to Twitter. So don't put all your money on followers on one social media platform. The best way of setting yourself up for the future is actually having a mailing list where you, because email is always going to be there. You can always have that one-to-one -one, uh, transaction between you and your customer. So definitely do a mailing list. The one thing is, though, you've got to come up with something that is uh, compelling to make someone sign up to your email list. If, uh, if you want to see a really good example of them, look at Bao's um, mailing list. Each, each time they send it, it's incredibly nicely designed. It's got stuff about what their business is doing, but then it's also got interesting other bits. So it might be like a nice illustration or an article that someone's written or like pointing you to different links on the internet that you might find interesting. Try and think about what kind of email you really appreciate dropping into your inbox and then make it look like that. Make it interesting, basically. That's all I'm going to say. And then Zero, Rob talked about this the other day. Just get set up in Zero or QuickBooks. They're basically the same, same as iZettle Square. They all essentially do the same thing. Zero is probably the best in the way that iZettle is probably the best. So do that. Uh, I think Rob discussed about expenses and receipts on uh, in his Zero uh, chat. There are other there are other things that manage that for you, but with Zero you can just take a picture of your receipt and then you can reconcile it. So that's Tech Adult. Then the last stage, the third stage, this is the point where you're getting serious and you probably have more than one site. And if you didn't put any of these things in place, you'd probably be tearing your hair out, looking at loads of different Excel spreadsheets, going like, I don't know what any of these mean anymore. And if someone left, you're totally screwed. So this is tech legend. Um, so this is, this is where shit's getting serious and you can actually have a tangible impact on your business by putting some of these systems in place. Um, so actually, I'll just go back to Lily's website here. You see, she has a shop here. Oh, she doesn't. Oh, man, that's <laughs> I should have tested that before. Uh, but you can have an online shop on, on your website. And if you're selling something like your at-home kits, so Truffle was one of our Tom who spoke a few weeks previously started selling uh, burger kits at home, did it on an online shop, and then using one called Shopify. There are tons of other online shops you can use. Shopify is the best. Uh, you can integrate it with loads of different other systems. So I believe, Tom, when you place an order with Tom, it automatically starts the delivery process as well. So he doesn't have to worry about like writing down who he's delivered for or anything like that. He can print off the labels, stick it on, DPD have been notified, all that kind of stuff. So definitely have a look at that. Uh, with iZettle or Square, they have an inbuilt app when you get it, which is essentially a POS system. So that's how you control how much the card reader is going to take uh, from someone. If you want more functionality, look at one, look at bigger ones. There's one called GoodTill that Curb uses. It's very good. Um, the extra functionality you get with that is stuff like you can put ingredients for each product, you can put different product lists and all that kind of stuff, and then it can almost do a stock count for you. So there's loads of things it can do, um, but definitely if you're if you're going to take over a fixed site and you're not going to be there all the time, it, that's something that uh, you might want to have a look at because it's really useful. Then as your team grows, uh, 
you want to have a look at HR apps. There's one called Harry that's very useful, and there's one called Charlie HR that's very useful. These are all just examples. There are tons out there. But basically, they keep track of everyone who works for you, keeps track of their documentation, so their right to work stuff, holidays, uh, reviews, everything can go to that. It's super useful for keeping track of maybe more than 10 people. Um, so, oh, God. Oh, I don't have my wallet with me. Plio is a really good new thing I've just discovered. I've just been put on it at uh, my work. It's a credit card, basically. It's like a top-up card, but you have a monthly balance on it. And you pay on that, and it's just perfect for your expenses. So have a look at that. And then lastly, this is my favorite app of all the apps. This is one called Airtable, which... Um, Essentially, if you want to do something that on an Excel spreadsheet, but it's the Excel spreadsheet sort of like creaking at the seams because it's getting too hard, have a look at something like Airtable. I'm not going to go too much into it because it's more quite complicated, but it's essentially a spreadsheet and a database. There's tons of things you can look for in it. Um, if you get to this stage, just remember I said Airtable and then have a look at it. It's kind of what this is. So this is a food costing calculator that there's a template of. You have all of your ingredients. You can do all your food costings and all that kind of stuff. If you're techn technologically minded, definitely have a look at it because it's amazing. If you're not, just wait. That you don't have to worry about it just now. And then lastly, you have all these like myriad of apps. If you want to link them together, there's one called Zapier, which it can link basically any app that you can probably think of or use and get it to do something into another one. So you might have MailChimp and then it triggers on loads of different things. So you might have some like a new person signs up to your mailing list. You might want to get a notification on your phone or something like that. You can do that in this. So they're ba I'm basically giving you the tools for the future uh, now. So in the future, if you get stuck, come back to this spread, uh, come back to this presentation and look at some of the things I've said, and then you'll be like, oh, actually, that was really useful. But essentially, that's it. That's my tech tips. P, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Ollie. Um, you're absolutely right. Like once you're doing them, it totally makes sense. But from, you know, from the boggled mind of the person who's about to start a food business, um, it probably might be a bit like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But Airtable is a brilliant thing. It's a really dynamic spreadsheet. And I don't I don't think you have to be that tech minded to use it. I think it all no, starts to make sense. You just have to spend a little bit of time. And I think that's the thing with all of this stuff. It's like investing a little bit of time learning how to do it, which is not something a lot of us are actually good at. We just think, oh, I just want it to be really easy, really quickly. So you then revert to just the way that you already know it, which is something that's really good about you is you spend a bit of time figuring it out and then suddenly your life is made a million times easier. Um, and I think it's a lesson that a lot of us can learn. I definitely could learn just spending some time getting to know this thing and like spending time getting to know Airtable it, you know, even at my basic level of understanding it, it really is, it really is a, a really nice um, platform. And um, I, I can strongly recommend it. Like, for example, you just showed the food costings. We could have put that um, a few weeks ago when we did business week and we were doing working out the price of your dish. We could have put it in Airtable, but obviously not everyone's going to have Airtable. But that would be wonderful in there because then you can link to where you're buying it from, um, you can link into all sorts of other kind of costings around it. What would you, how would you, just as an example, because everyone has used this price, uh, pricing your dish spreadsheet in yeah. regular old Excel slash sheets. What would you say the equivalent on Airtable would enable you to do that you can't do on sheets? Um, I mean, so I'm, I, I will answer that question, but I'm just going to say something about Airtable again. Um, essentially, Airtable gets useful at the point where your Excel spreadsheets get too complicated to manage. I'm very, I'm very like aware that not everyone 
once they go on a totally new system. So if an Excel sheet is working for you, absolutely fine, keep using it. But there will be a point where you're like, oh, this is getting too unwieldy. And it happened to me. We used to do the rotors for all the markets on an Excel sheet. And it was the worst thing in the world. It was like it was like 10 tabs for different markets, hundreds of things, and it just kept going wrong. So I think there's a there's this concept called pain driven development, right? And it's the idea that when you hit something that hurts and it and or you're sick of doing, that's the moment where you go like, right, I'm going to make that better. And so I would say, you want if your if your food cost and calculator on uh, Excel is working well, that's great. But if you wanted to say, here's an example. You use more than one ingredient. You more than one of your recipes uses the same ingredient. On Excel, you have to copy each one, and it and it and it doesn't update. But in uh, Airtable, you essentially just refer to that ingredient. So if you had like lemongrass in a curry or something, at any time you're doing lemongrass, you just have to update the lemongrass record, and then it will update all the costs. I'm 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 worried that I'm getting too deep into it, but um. I would, I would essentially say just only use the systems that are really complicated when you need them to. If things work for you and they're working great, absolutely perfect. Like if you only have a few employees and you're being a, you can book them on a rotor like by text and it's absolutely fine. You don't need you don't need a rotor system. You only need it when it becomes a problem. If anything if anything increasing the amount of admin you need you do by implementing a system like that is probably the wrong way to go. So, like Petra, you'll you'll agree with this mantra: simplicity is key, right? Yeah. Just make it as simple as possible. The idea of any of these solutions are to make it more simple for you. So only do it when it make it feels like it's simpler. Absolutely. Keep it as simple as you possibly can for as long as you can, and then when you start feeling the pain, remember PDD pain driven development and that's the moment at which you might want to make the switch um i think we've all been there with lots of different things so thank you ollie we're going to um share that presentation i'm conscious that we said we'd share a presentation of rob's the other day um not a presentation but his workings on his spreadsheet but when i looked at them i just felt like you already had those workings yourself so i haven't actually shared it but please in the comments right if I'm wrong and you're like, no, I, actually I've been waiting for that, where the hell is it? Um, but I looked at it and I was like, it's the same spreadsheet, it's just got someone else's um, additions into it. But yeah, let me know if I'm wrong. With Ollie's presentation, we'll put it in a section in Operations Week that we will create um, and we'll do that tonight. So that'll be ready for tomorrow. Um, Ollie, thank you, we're gonna bring you back for a discussion of the equipment. Um, that people <laughs> that people are talking about um, bringing into their businesses. So thank you very much. He does tech and he does ops and equipment. So he's very versatile, Ollie. Thanks, Ollie. See you in a minute. Um, okay, so we are now going to bring in Nick Friedman, the godfather of street food. He doesn't come out a lot, so it's really wonderful that he's agreed to come out for this. Um, even though he doesn't actually have to go out, he is out in public for this. So, Nick, are you there? Hey, everyone. Hope Hi. you're well. How are you doing, Nick? Good, good. Excited to be talking to adults for a change. Um, <laughs> yeah, a, a small disclaimer, I've got two young kids who probably won't run into the room a bit later at bedtime, but if it happens, I, I'm sorry in advance. Yeah. We'll all have to deal yeah. with it. So, so Nick, pain-driven development. I'm sure this is something that um, strikes a chord with you. Yeah, it, it's the only way. You know, it, I mean, the, the other you know cliche: no pain, no gain. So, I guess no pain, no pain-driven development. Most of the things that have happened in my business and, and probably in my life has been, ah, oh, that hurts too much. Let me try and find a way to make it easier. I mean, it, it's common sense, but the thing about common sense is it isn't all that common. So you often got to be taken to the point of desperation where you go, I'm sure there's a better way of doing this. And then you ask a question and somebody says, oh, yeah, you can do it like this. Wow. OK. And then suddenly, you know, you're richer and, you know, a lot less tired and so on. And then on to the next thing and on the next thing and and so on. You know, you never really stop developing or improving, I think. 
Yeah, and again, it's something we've talked about a lot in the course so far. It's like you can sit around and plan for this all you like, but until you actually jump in the arena and start finding your way around and meeting people and talking to people and sharing ideas, you're not going to get propelled along at the rate at which you'd like to. Um, from the from the from from your own home, it's quite difficult to kind of like imagine how you're going to innovate around something. It takes being around other people in order to innovate and actually jumping in and giving it a go and getting the pain and everything. So it's, it's an important part of the process. No pain, no gain, absolutely. Um, so Nick, I've known for a very long time when I was struggling along doing festivals with my chocolate van. Um, I'm not really an ops kind of person. I, I find logistics just, you know, they're not really my bag. Um, but I was suddenly, I was doing all these back-to-back -back festivals for summer after summer after summer. And I was going, oh my God, if I'm gonna sell enough of my product to enough people to make it worth paying that huge pitch fee, um, and all the other costs that go with going to do a festival, I've got to figure out how to sell more. I've got to figure out how to operationally make it work better. And I'd be there kind of with my sort of weird sort of makeshift stalls and signage and everything. And all this team of people who were there to help me and me just looking over the field at people like Nick, who was just like bashing out these amazing um, frontages and getting all his kit and wiring up all his um plugging in all his um gas equipment and just had this whole kind of like amazing systems going on and then he'd just be serving 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 he basically created a business which is paella uh which was designed to be able to serve very very quickly and it was all about the setup and making sure the setup was so solid that nothing was gonna let him down when he was actually serving the food. Um, and I'm sure Nick can talk all about the benefits of having a narrow and deep menu as opposed to a wide and shallow one. And I'd love you to talk about that actually, Nick, because it's a very important thing to think about. Um, in a world where you're so excited and you wanna do everything, what actually is gonna work for you? Um, so we'll come on to that. But Nick, it's really great to have you here. Um, the first question I wanna ask you is, do you have to love logistics to be good at street food? Um, I'm not sure about love, but you've definitely got to be madly in like with it. Um, you know, we were talking about this early on, like you, you, we call it street food. You could also call it logistics and pain. Um, but obviously one attracts people to the industry and one doesn't. Um, there, there's a lot of food, but behind the food is even more logistics. And um, uh, excuse me a sec. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm not reading a story tonight. No, mommy's reading a story. I'm literally in the middle of it. Dude, tomorrow night's my night. Dude. Age five going on 15. Tomorrow's my night to read a story. I didn't actually make it up. Um, so, yeah, logistics is so much a part of it. it um, you know, when people arrive at the front of the store and they go, oh, this is cool, uh, what they reali don't realize is that a lot of the uncool stuff has happened all the way along and literally the little things that you that I spend my days and nights thinking about trying to plan around in advance but like your staff don't pitch up on time or there's traffic or the power's not on or the gas is running out all these sort of things all these thought processes are going through your mind before you arrive before you start setting up there it's it's more not so much logistics as like plan where's your plan g plan h for when plan c has failed so i, I think if you're not into that state of mind then it's tricky. Um, I mean, I love a problem to solve, love it. Um, so I, I wouldn't say I create problems, but um, street food does create a lot of problems and challenges, which in turn you answer through careful logistics and planning. So there's a very long way of saying, yes, you need to love logistics. Yeah, and and in street food particularly, I mean, a, a, most people on this course are looking to get into street food. Some people want to open a cafe or a restaurant or something like that. So it's not 100 percent all street food people. Um, but there is a there is a sort of um, immediate stress and immediate reward sort of level of um, addiction stroke hell in street food where you are you you're dealing with so many um unpredictable elements that you have to be able to problem solve really quickly on your feet and so to be able to like we said in the course so far if you, so to be able to build systems that enable you to not have a total meltdown when things go wrong because they will go wrong is vital here 
totally. Yeah. Um, so, being a great cook aside, what is it important to know from an operational point of view in order to run a profitable food business? So, thinking about the, the most important thing to run a profitable business is really to know what your costs are. I mean, your cost of sales. So, exactly how much, exactly, but you know, roughly how much it costs you to serve one meal. And that includes your food, your serving containers, the staff involved, you know, gas, power, that sort of thing. You need to know your break even point because it, it's, it's easy to swan up to a place and, and serve food um, and not make money. Um, and then once you know your break even point and the number of people involved in, in producing that, you can you know, work out how many staff you actually need. You know, so if you can you save a hundred pound on a staff member or eighty pound on a staff member, you know, can you prep or cook on the day on the day when you're actually there, or do you have to do it a day or two days beforehand? You know, all of these things add in costs. You know, people are the biggest cost. Um, obviously, we want to employ people, but you kind of want to have that balance. Um, also, uh, thinking about on the staff point of view, like if you have somebody on the till, very often I see stalls and, and restaurants and any sort of food outlets where somebody's on the till, they take the till order, they put it through, they smile, and then then they sit around waiting for the next one. Whereas you should be asking questions like, can that person be doing something else? Can they be chopping something? Can they be organizing something? Why are they not busy? Um, you know, if you've got a two or three hour service time, everyone should be doing something all the time, in, in my opinion. Um, your downtime comes afterwards. Um, also, it's important to know how to set up an efficient serving line, I think, or production line. So from your equipment to your customer, um, everything should be honed, you know, as much as possible. So it should be very slick. It should be very professional. Um, when you have a, a busy stall, you shouldn't be crossing each other. You know, when you're walking, you're walking one way and somebody's walking the other way. That's a recipe for disaster. You know, everybody's kind of moving around each other. Um, so that it minimizes the risks of damaging each other, you know, knives and hot oil and all that sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, you need to look calm and organized while you're moving around quickly and, and most probably panicking a lot inside, you know, because nobody likes buying from panicked people. They like nice, quiet, calm and order. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about is if you want to keep it slick and making money really from what you're doing, you really need to be able to gear up and down. Um, because if you have a long queue of people, you want to keep on producing food so you can keep on serving those people because ultimately that queue goes away at the end of lunch or dinner or whenever it is. But by the same token, you know, being the UK, the weather can turn very quickly. I mean, these days there's lots of things that can change very quickly. Um, and you need to be able to react to that. And if, you know, four or 500 pounds worth of stock is sitting with you, that can't just be thrown away. That's a direct, you know, a direct cost to you. So how do you then handle the situation when you have to start getting things chilled down? You have to freeze things. Um, how do you save your stock, et cetera, et cetera? Um, lots and lots of questions that go through your mind probably before you start service. Well, and you know, the more you question, the more you talk to people, the more you get these answers, the more, the more you work, the more experience you have. Um, but to me, I guess, to summarize, it comes down to, how much money do you, are you spending? How many staff do you need? How do you make it as efficient as possible? And how can you save it all when it all goes to shit in a day? I hope that covers it. Sorry for saying shit. You're but, not saying shit. Yeah. What did you once used to do really inefficiently that then you changed and everything improved? So this is gonna be a bit controversial. Um, we used to have a, a full-time person cleaning paella pans we'd finish serving a pan, we'd pass it on to somebody, they'd take it somewhere where we'd set up an equipment wash setup, which is tricky in a three by three setup. Um, they'd clean the pan, we'd come back on and we'd start cooking again on it. So I had a lot of pans and I was paying somebody a lot of money and we were using a lot of water, a lot of equipment set up just to be able to clean the pans. And one day we thought, do we have to do this? Maybe we can just scrape out all the stuff from the previous pan, deglaze it a bit and carry on cooking. So we ran it by an EHO and they said, yeah, sure. So we started doing that and like, whoa, my, my profits went up. Yeah, it was crazy. We didn't have to have an extra person. We didn't have to have running water all the time. Didn't have to have hot water. It was suddenly a game changer of, oh, wow, we can just keep the same equipment and just go. You know, we're still being safe. We're still being clean. Um, and now, yeah, game changer. And once we started doing that, we started cleaning all of our equipment on the stall. So we brought enough we were able to make enough hot water, so we cleaned everything there. So by the time we packed the van, 
everything was clean and dry. And that just saved you so much heartache down the line. So these weren't major changes for a light bulb moment for making more money with the business, but it was like we're saving an hour and a half a day and a whole staff member who hated their job anyway because all they were doing was cleaning stuff. Um, it was a big move forward. Suddenly it opens up, you know, my mind is open to do a lot more creative things rather than just admin. Yeah, there's there's so many, if you go to the market at the end of the day, so like after 2.30, say, after people, a, a lunch market, so normally your service would be between 12 and 2, and by about 2.30, you've probably served your final customer um, and you're packing down. It's really interesting watching who leaves the quickest, who's able to leave the quickest, and who's there hanging around, just kind of still got mountains and mountains to do. Um, but by that same token, you've got someone like Simon from Luados, who we've already spoken about earlier in this course, who does everything in the van. He doesn't have to pay for a unit. He doesn't have to pay for people to prep in a unit. He does it all there. So he has to get there extra early and he leaves extra late. But that's it for him then. He doesn't have to go anywhere. He doesn't have to find anyone to do anything in a, another place. It's all centralized in that one van so it's quite interesting thinking about the different approaches that people have to um their pack down and what is actually a good use of their time and money look i mean to me that's the dream you you start early you end late but then it's done you know you've left the work at work you're not have to, there's no overflow um especially when it comes to cleaning i mean nobody really enjoys cleaning um yeah. especially after a long hard day and it's wet and windy and cold and yeah, so kudos to Simon. Yeah, he's nailed it. Yeah, the overflow is is almost kind of the hellish bit. Like the service is the fun bit. It's the adrenaline. It's the performance. It's the connection with the people eating your food and enjoying the food. And the setup's exciting because you see all the other traders and you're chatting and you're getting all ready and you're full of hope that you're going to make some good money that day. It's the pack down that is fine, but then it's like, oh, I've just packed down, especially gazebo traders, right, who kind of had to lug a lot of equipment around mm. and they've packed down maybe in the rain, quite possibly, and then they've got to drive all the way down to, I don't know, say from the Gherkin down to Wimbledon, for example. That might take them an hour. Then they get to the unit and then they've got to, like, wash up or they've got to deal with a load of other kind of stock rotation stuff. And, and their day that might have started at 7 with them needing to be on site by nine to get ready and everything might not end till seven actually and it's they're just long long days so it's why we keep on saying think of ways to make it as easy as possible for yourself for it not to take excessive amounts of time and it's you know what we used we used a case study nick in last week's lesson of um ali hopper do you remember them with the smoked fish yeah, yeah and their business was so inefficient. It was so wonderful, their product. We all love the food, but it was so inefficient because it involved every week having to drive to Norfolk, pick up the fish, come back, smoke it, do all these different things to it, and then turn up and actually offer the customers something that that audience didn't necessarily want, even though it was wonderful. Not many people want to eat an open sandwich for their lunch, because you've got to think about, is it easy to eat? Do you understand it? Can you, is it portable? You know, all sorts of other considerations. And they were ending up spending something like 72 hours a week each to only be taking about 150 quid per lunch, um, maybe three times a week. And after a while they were like, actually this is not really working out that well for us. And that's an extreme example, but, you know, it's pretty common. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm sorry for them. The food was delicious, but it, and it wasn't exactly pearls before swine because that would be insulting. But it was um, a very, it was an amazing product, possibly in the wrong place. Um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit like an like artwork that they were producing, but it wasn't really being bought. I mean, hopefully they would have, uh, in, in time, maybe they would have found the right marketplace for themselves. But a busy lunchtime market in the city it, that wasn't the place to be but yeah I'm, I'm sorry to see them go their food is amazing well they didn't really go because they just uh, converted into something else which was luxury flats yes genius name. Oh my God. <laughs> that's yeah. the best name ever um so they didn't really go but they that ali hopper went but they didn't they, the owners didn't go um so nick you've set up at more events than anyone will ever know 
How do you go about planning your setup for minimum fuss and maximum output? Well, how long is a piece of string? I mean, you guys touched on it earlier. Simplicity is key. Um, yeah, keep it simple. You don't overcomplicate anything. Uh, to my mind, the cardinal rule should be your setup should be doable without you there because that can happen. And the same thing, you, you're you building processes, basically steps in processes. All, all the catering, producing anything really is, is a step of processes. You start, start here, you go here, you go here, and ultimately the customer gets food, which they eat, talk about, and then repeat, and so on. Um, I wouldn't build a process step that can only be done by you. That's the most important thing because if you're indispensable, then your business can't go on if you are sick or something has happened or you have a second setup and so on and so forth. So when you're thinking about this, think, can the most unqualified person of my team do this? And if not, it's probably too complicated and either they need to be better trained or I need to find a better way of doing it. Um, so another thing I would think about is plan your workflow as in how you're going to get from raw to cooked to served and then do the setup for that you know just follow the workflow because that's kind of how it should be don't don't impose your own way of thinking on it it's i'm cooking raw meat it's going to be cooked it's going to go into a bun it's going to go over here keep it as simple as that right um the other thing what we try and do especially with, with my stalls is we keep the front area just for service we don't cook anything there so um because you're not really making any money out of the cooking. The cooking should be done, in my mind, in my opinion, in the back, where you have lots of space. You can sort of extend out the back if you need to, and so on and so forth. Um, the front is for assembly. You know, that's your entertaining area, your slick handiwork, your applying your thing with the tweezers, if that's your thing, or the squeezy bottle, and so on and so forth. That's the wow factor. People aren't necessarily looking at you using a deep fat fry in the back going, wow, look at how they're frying. But they are looking at you putting stuff into one hand and then filling it with something with the other hand and then think, then wow, that's mine. I'm going to get that in a few seconds. I'm going to talk about that. So that's making you money. Um, and that's why all of that entertainment should be in the front. I mean, I kind of joke about it in some presentations, like don't put plants in the front unless you're selling plants. I mean, it's kind of true. You know, everything in the front should be dedicated to service out as quickly as possible because you need to keep your queue moving. Um, some practical things that I've been thinking about, um, if you have a gas setup, get a hard gas pipe with quick release fittings. So it's literally just plug and play. You don't want to be using wrenches and screwing things in and out. That's just a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, we talk about eyes, Etel and Square. Get three of those card readers. Don't bring one because one will break or run out of charge or something like that. And when that happens, you can't take money. So get three. They're not that expensive. Um, when you're planning your store layout, I'd keep staff relatively far apart. I mean, it's going to sound really cliched now, but like one meter plus distance, you know, we kind of all used to it by now anyway. But you don't want people bumping into each other when you're moving food or anything. You don't want people crossing each other. You really want people moving in circles around each other. So they literally, they seem a bit like automata walking around each other, but that's the most efficient way to go. You're not sort of moving left and right quickly and then accidentally skewering somebody with, with a sharp knife or something hot. Um, and the last thing on that was when you're packing your van, I mean, people kind of forget about this and vans I've seen loaded end up looking like massive games of Tetris. It's not going to save you any time on before and after setup. And really, you should be setting things up. The things that you need quickly should come out first. Everything should be on shelves. People kind of forget about shelves in vans. They keep things off the ground and they keep things nicely organized. Um, and if you, I've always believed your van is nicely organized, then your store will be nicely organized as well because you're just in that mindset from when you arrive on site. Um, I hope that's answered the question. Sure has. Thank you. Um, I've got two more questions for you. Um, one of them is, would you like to describe what you mean by a narrow and deep menu versus a wide and shallow one? Sure. So case in point, jamon, jamon, paella. We used to do two options, chicken or seafood, and now we do three, chicken, seafood, or vegan. Um, and that's it. So we've got big pans of food cooked and you can have one of three. Um, better would have been just chicken and one other or seafood and one other. So two options because then when you're looking at your queue, you know they want one of two things or worst case, one of three things and you can just start prepping for that. Um, if you've got four or five things on your menu and you have a long queue, 
what do they want? What is the person five, six, ten you know, places down in the queue? What do they want? How do you start preparing to serve them? Because really, if you want to be busy and make money in a short you know, service time, you need to be thinking not about the person in the front, but the person five or six down the way. Um, so the more things you have, the more complicated your service comes, the more ingredients you need, uh, the more waste you have. Um, I mean, the, the example I like to use is the rib man, um, aside from being a genius guy. He does one thing, ribs. You want the rib meat in a bun or rib meat not in a bun? So he's got no waste. He's got rib meat. He's cooked it all. He's going to sell it out. He's got some buns. If he doesn't sell them, he puts them in the freezer. Nothing really goes wrong there unless you know there's a massive problem and nobody can come to his store. Whereas I've seen people with four or five things, and uh, they look amazing. It's like a gastro pub has been imported onto the street. But they're throwing away an enormous amount of like hispy cabbage and all sorts of like ingredients that have got like a very short shelf life because they didn't call it right because it turns out that everybody wanted the pulled pork sandwich and nobody wanted you know the um sort of slightly different japanese sausage marinated in yuzu and blah 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 because that didn't go on that day now what are you doing with all of those ingredients pretty much going in the bin and so that's why narrow and deep just works i believe it works better as well because street food and, and generally other sort of kiosky type food in the uk is kind of borrowed from the east the street food concept you know it's a street food culture and most stalls they do one thing and they just do it really well and they become famous for that one thing so they don't have a problem they don't have to do two or three things because their one thing is giving them enough of a livelihood so move that sort of mindset over here if you become known for that one thing then you don't have to worry about all the other things and people enough people will come to you if you become good enough for that one thing you'll make great business out of it i mean there's loads of examples out there so there we go narrow and deep yeah, and the inverse of that is wide and shallow, where when that goes wrong, it's you keep on running out of stuff. So you've got all these people in your queue, and you don't know what they're queuing for. They could be queuing for one of five different things. And you, the likelihood of disappointing them when they get to the front, if you haven't been smart enough or like friendly enough or whatever to have shouted down and said, hey, I've run out of such and such, and just kind of like manage their expectations a bit in, in advance, which um, we've spoken about a little bit in next week's lesson, um, then you're basically confronting um, the possibility of lots of disappointed people, which is harmful to you. You become seen as a, brand, a business that is not reliable that you're, it's not worth turning up to at 1.30 because you're probably sold out of that food. So you probably, they probably won't make the journey to make that effort to come to it. So it's like, it's really great when there's all this amazing choice in some ways, but it makes it harder to make your decision as the customer. And it makes it more likely that the thing you want isn't available because the alternative for the person preparing the food is, is loads of waste, unless they only make a small amount of that particular dish um and in it, either way it's just it just it, it weakens you as a business because people don't see you as somebody that they can get that food from at any time of you being open and everyone kind of you know like sells out sometimes you know it's a great problem to have but it's better to sell out right at the end of the day rather than oh god i've run out of this but i've got this but then your menu starts looking really kind of holy and you've only got like two things but it looks like you used to have all these other things so the expectation from sure. the customer is like oh there's not much left whereas if you only ever had two things in the first place just like nice and strong it's just like okay cool i know what i'm dealing with my expectations have been managed yeah couldn't agree more it's um it was it's, it's, it's people's expectations are they don't come to a a food stall or a kiosk expecting a massive menu. I mean, that that, that argument's been had a long time ago. They, they come for that one thing or those two things that you're really good at. I, I really don't think that they're too perturbed about you having not having a, you know, the, the one thing which they, you sell one portion out of a hundred of. I, I really think they prefer to get the most popular ones that everybody's talking about, and, and that's it. Yeah, and making it really easy for people to make up their minds because, as we keep on saying, in this world of infinite choice, it's such a relief when somebody makes it easy for you just to make up your mind, almost just takes the decision making away from you or makes it very, very simple. Simplicity, sure. as always. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there's an example with, with burgers, for example, or, or pizzas. If all you're doing is pizzas, two or three types of them, or, or burgers, two types of them. If you have a queue of 20 people, but let's use burgers as an example. You've got a queue of 20 people. You can whack 20 burgers onto the griddle because you know they're only going to want a burger because that's the only thing you sell. 
So you don't have to have the person come to the front to go, oh, what have you got? Looking up down the menu, I'll have that burger. Like, burger, cool, great idea. I'll put it on the griddle now. You know, you've kind of already lost the guys, seven or eight people down the line. So if you're always playing for the the tenth person in the in the queue, it just makes more sense to have less choice for them, because you know, yeah, as you say, choice is a horrible thing. Yeah, so. and queue management, queue man management. If you can figure it out, is a really really powerful thing. Um, and there's all sorts of things to say about that, um, which maybe we can come to. But okay, final question. So we talked about Ali Hopper a minute ago, who had, are doing all this really amazing food, but they weren't making any money out of it. Who do you know who is doing a really great and unique product, but who has also managed to figure out how to also make money from it at the same time? So uh, Bian Dang. Um, he's a friend of mine, Tristan. They do Taiwanese lunchboxes. Um, I mean, the irony is he's, he's as Taiwanese as I am. He's also from South Africa. Um, they do Their food is amazing. Um, it's great value. It's a big box of food. Uh, it's a good price, great taste, uh, great ingredients. Like Everything about it is great because Tristan's pretty OCD about that sort of thing. Um, but all of his staff are working efficiently. Like if you go to the stall and the person, I talked about this before, the person on the till takes your money and then they take rice from a rice cooker and they stick it in a container and they move it on to somebody else. So they've already doubled their role. Um, nobody's got any downtime on the stall. Everything is happening. Everything's cooked fresh. Um, there's very little waste because, um, say for example, he's got marinated chicken, marinated pork that goes into a fryer to cook. If he's not cooking it, then it just goes straight back into the fridge or the freezer and so on. So by the end of the day, what he hasn't sold is being saved um, and can be carried over for at least a few days or frozen. Um, everybody's working efficiently. His store is, very, is ridiculously clean. I mean, you, you could lick everything in there beforehand and he's meticulous about the cleaning. So you walk up to that store, there's a queue outside, the food looks great, great colors, great taste. The size of the box, it's like it's eight quid. Like, wow, that's a lot of food for eight quid. I think he's nailed every part of it. Um, and it's, it shows wherever he goes to sell his food. And, and he's got some very, very loyal followers. Yeah. He's South African, best part. And he's South African. And he's making money. Yes. He's, uh, yeah, he's doing fine. He's doing well. It's, um, I, I know his margins, like they, they, they're not as high as they could be because I think he buys great produce um, and he's got a fair amount of prep involved. But yeah, it's a very successful business. Yeah, great. And he's and he's able to diversify it, which he's in the midst of doing at the moment, isn't he? He's doing carts. He's going to position carts all over in stations all over the place where they're just handing out those lunch boxes, which have been pre-prepared. Yeah, no, man, that guy's got some great ideas. He's got like vending machines in his in his head and so on. I mean, I hope it all comes to fruition. I mean, if you can find it where he does the the, the steamed buns with the, the the pork belly, I mean, that's just it's divine. And he's got an, like an egg that he cooks for forty eight hours. It's mental. I yeah. Mean, we spoke about um the beast box in um all right week one or two i can't remember which one it was but just like all the different components that make it up that make it very unreplicable and therefore very desirable um and obviously it's large as well and, and everyone just does like large portions let's face it um yeah. nick thank you so much are you ready to talk about equipment bring it on should we bring ollie on for backup yes let's do it Hi. The hunter. Hi, Ollie. I'm back. Um, okay, cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over some of the um, homework assignments that were handed in um, and just use them as a good jump off point to discuss equipment. Please, if you've got comments, put them in and we will get to them after we've spoken about this, um, especially if it's your um, list that we're talking about. Um, so let's go straight into it. We've got Anil with Bombay Talkies, which is um, Pau Badgies. Um, and it's a really nice business idea, this, um, and I think it will be very popular. So looking at this, both of you, what are you saying about the equipment list that Anil has listed? So we've got gas griddles. We've got, I can't, I'm finding it actually quite hard to read this. Cooking, does that say cooking tongs? Yeah. Cooking tongs, yeah. Okay, who can read the list? I'll read it. Thanks. <laughs> We've got two gas griddles, four cooking tongs, four spatulas, two electric griddles, two three by three gazebos, two gazebo rain gutters, galvanized steel tables, uh, hand wash unit, fire extinguishers, fire blankets, flooring, cool boxes, temperature probes, fridge probes, 
scales, knife case, and then six knives and a dustpan and brush. The metal dustpan and brush that Joel uh, highlighted. Yeah. Um, Good should, idea. Shall I go first, Nick, or would you like to say something? Uh, go for it. The one thing I would say is that it this is an amazing kit list for a business that has been going for a while. I think having both uh, gas and electric straight away and two three by three gazebos, unless your uh, unless your setup needs two three by three gazebos, you can probably just get away with just the gas griddles and one gazebo. And then as your business grows and you get more opportunities, then that's when you uh, invest in electric griddles and another gazebo. Like this is it's, it's a great kit list, but um, it's quite a lot of money <laughs> up front, I'd say. What yeah, it just adds to that um, I agree with you. I mean, you start small. Um, or just those two gas griddles. Um, sorry, Anil, for sounding like short, but I mean, are they made of gold? Because that's an enormous amount of money for a gas griddle. I, I think you can probably get uh, cheaper ones. There's a the, the sort of the, the de facto one on the street is the Parry PGF 800. Um, it's just it's, a, it's an amazing workhorse. It's light, uh, gets hot pretty quickly, and I think brand new. They're probably se seven or eight hundred quid each. Yeah, uh, I'm just looking at it now. Six, uh, six, nine, six. There we go. So um, I, I had a brief look early on at the Falcon F900, and I mean, there's lots of them. They look very sexy, but um, I'm I'm not entirely sure you need that right away. Um, also, on the on the electric griddles, you can get cheaper ones. Um, the there's a brand called Buffalo. Now that the room is divided on Buffalo, to be fair, I, I haven't seen um, Joel's video presentation i'm not sure what he feels about them you tend to get what you pay for um but i have i own two uh buffalo electric griddles and, and i've had no trouble with them whatsoever i don't use them day in day out i mean like for light use once a week once every couple of weeks they seem fine but going on what Audi was saying you can get that sort of thing within a couple of days online um i wouldn't go buying everything right now unless you have lots of events lined up where you desperately need them um but I mean, my main point was really on the gas pedals. I think you're spending two and a half to three grand more than you need to right, right up. I think Anil has not come to play. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think he's really kind of going for it. And I think he's seen the, um, our recommendation. So we did recommend the Falcon in our equipment yeah. list as like the big daddy. We recommend yeah. a couple of others as well. So he's gone, right, I'm going for it. I don't want to have to buy twice, I, I imagine. Um, so I think that's probably what that's all about. But obviously, Nick, you've you've operated perfectly um, fine with that with a good old buffalo. So it's really I think it's down to like how you want to approach it. I mean, some people like I when I started, I just wanted the best of everything. And then I started looking around. It's like, oh, actually, it's going to cost me a fortune. And so you start making a few compromises and you wait to pay for certain other things as you go through. But this is like the wish list almost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Uh tons of businesses that when they start they don't invest properly with the in the equipment and then they end up just spending more and more money so if you if you did have enough money to go with this like on the whole a lot of this um, equipment will keep its value so you can in the end if if something went wrong you could sell it but um yeah you would you would be set up for pretty much the next five years by getting this stuff i reckon yeah so this is a good investment if you can if you can really take that plunge um okay let's move on to the next one so we've got enrico fabiana fabiani hi enrico i hope you're doing well this is elizabeth's wood-fired lasagne and this is going to be from a truck um i believe so what are your thoughts lads uh my first thought is that sounds amazing wood-fired lasagne i mean you had me at hello um <laughs> I mean, it's a nice list, and it's also, it, 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 to me, it reads nice and clean. You know, if you need more ovens, you buy another uni wood-fired oven, and you put it next to the first one. Um, they're great ovens. Um, it, uh, you, I think we're probably going to be cooking the lasagna elsewhere, it seems, and then bringing it on site, but I'm not I'm not sure, entirely sure of the process. Um, but, uh, yeah, it looks it looks good. Um, I'm not, you probably wouldn't need that much more to start with for, for serving it. Um, you seem to have got the right price on the shelter. I noticed on a couple of other ones, the prices for shelters vary. It might just be the, the packages that, that people are going for. Um, looks good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think Nick's right. When it when it comes to wood fired oven, like that's the only limiting factor with this business is to how many lasagnas can you get in the oven. So if you have a way of expanding that size, and that works well, I know Born and Raised who do wood fired uh, pizzas when they do a fest because it's theirs is all built into a, a Land Rover Defender, and so you can't really expand that. But when he does festivals, he has a trailer with a wood fired oven, and if, I guess if he really wanted to expand, he could have like a, a caterpillar of of trailers, just one behind the other, sure. just have like ten ovens. Those Unis, I mean, there's Uni and Rockbox. Those are the the two competing brands for pizza ovens, and and I know this because I I got given a Rockbox pizza by myself, a pizza by myself for Christmas, um, and they're great because they work really quickly. You can get one pizza or one big lasagna tray in at a time, but you can just multiply so easily. And a big pizza oven or a big wood fired oven is thousands of pounds, and it's a single point of failure. And you can have five or six of these puppies alongside each other doing exactly the same work as two massive pizza ovens. At a fraction of the cost, you know, mm. and something goes wrong, and you just plug it out, plug another one in. Great, great idea. Uh, and uh, yeah, Enrico would discover how quickly he can get these lasagnas out on his first day. So <laughs> you you would be able to make changes pretty easily, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nice clean list there, Enrico, and everyone's excited about the lasagna. Um, next, we've got Neil Spackman with torta which is an even more succinct list um so this is you know what these are nick uh, mexican tortas yeah um so yeah i love a torta um it's, it's a short list so i'm uh, there will be other things that you'll need um so my, my question i'm not sure if neil's listening or just as a general discussion point is is the bread going to be baked live on site, whether that's in a gazebo or a truck or a kiosk unit, etc., or is this oven more for reheating bread? Because to my mind, if you and I don't know the answer, but if you're looking to do like two, three hundred covers at a time, you, you should not be baking that bread on on the site. That bread should be baked by a, a bakery, a really good bakery, and it comes in, and then you are heating in the oven. Let's say, um, as an example, we. Um, We've been doing some stuff at Kew Gardens Christmas lights until um, that got shut down um, along with the whole country. So we were doing a, a sort of fancy hot dogs there and we were using a, a blue seal convection oven. We were heating our bread buns in it and we'd heat like 40, 50 at a time. So they'd come out and they were nice and steamy and warm, but we weren't baking them. They were being baked by an amazing bakery in Park Royal um, and being delivered to us. So that was what I was using the oven for, um, but that was more for service. I, you, you could very well be using your oven to bake stuff in advance so I, I just don't know the, the the context of it but i think it's important to think what you're using the oven for and also how heavy is that oven not just in terms of lifting it and moving it but in terms of power draw because the more the the bigger and better the oven the more power it sucks and the more power it sucks the less venues you can go to um or the, the more you'll pay for your power and if it's a gas oven the more gas you'll be using and so on. So these are the questions I think people need to be asking themselves is what am I using it for and what do I have to get in order to get that job done? Um, yeah, I agree. I agree with everything Nick says. I've, I've got, I've got, so I want to show you a uh, food van that I remember seeing a while ago. Just give me a second. This was um, Jamie Oliver. He used to run a, a restaurant called Barbacoa, and oh, he yeah. set up this uh, food van. And Nick, check out the inside of this. Oh, look at that. Wow. Isn't that insane? Jesus. <laughs> that, that is, well, okay, that's like a restaurant kitchen in, wow, okay, so no, no, budget, on, no budget limitations there. Yeah, Barbacoa unfortunately went into administration and I, I met the person that bought this. They bought it for something like 25 grand. How much do you think they would have spent on it? Uh, I'm going to say 50 or 60 grand. Mm. Yeah, 20, 25 wouldn't even cover the equipment. Wow. Yeah. I know, I was like, you wow. literally just won the lottery there. That's amazing. Um, yeah. I've just I mean, seen... th th this is the perennial argument of um going back to anil's list i mean that's an amazing list but that is kind of that's the gold star 
you know, what Jamie Oliver's done over here, and you know, I think he's done amazing stuff in his life generally is, but somebody's put their van together without really thinking about the the break even points, really going, okay, well, we can take five grand a day at lunchtime market. So it doesn't matter if we spend 35, 40 grand on equipment. And unfortunately it does matter um, because now they're, they don't exist anymore. Um, I mean, there's nothing that you couldn't produce in that van. I think it was a little bit over specced. Like they produce way too much food and they couldn't assemble it fast enough in, in the front. I mean, what do you do with yeah. like 80 kilos of pulled pork that's just arrived out the other? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. Like it's, it was, it's an insane van. I've just seen Neil's commented, by the way. He said the plan is to part bake the bread and finish it off in the morning. I've been working okay. on the bread. So, so just following on on that, if, um, finishing off in the oven. So basically, the bread would be finished before service, and then we'll just come out come out of the oven thereafter. Uh, we, we can wait for the um, for the answer. It is everybody's dream, though, who's doing anything bake to be able to have an oven on site that can that can be obviously fresh but can smell so amazing i remember thinking when i was starting out with my chocolate van i wanted to get an oven in my van and i was going to bake cookies and i was going to bake brownies and it was going to smell incredible and then it just became uh, just unpractical to even think about doing that because mainly because of the power but also because of the space and space is a real limitation um that everyone should think about and especially if you're in a gazebo it's like actually lugging the equipment around um is is going to be back breaking i would say to neil to go and uh speak to chris from my pie because he always had uh um ovens in his van and so he knows how to, he knows how that fits i think he used to have to open the back door and like push it half out probably not the best way of doing it no it's no. it's hard it's hard when it's mobile um okay let's go on to the next one So, so this um, is what, what, what which is only sugar, and it's um, cakes and pies. Okay. Nice. Cool. So, so, uh, so the, the oven's not going to be on at the service site, is it? This is at a, a prep area, or I'm guessing at? that. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know much about like big baking ovens and stuff. I mean, that seems fine, and I, I think with that sort of thing, you want to buy the the best you can get, really, because it's a massive single point of failure. If you if if you need the oven to produce everything that you make your money on, and that oven goes down, like you're in trouble. Yeah. So um, there's market stall. Um, you know the the gazebo and the folding tables. I I'm, I'm think that the idea is as you would imagine, is you make all the um, the pastries in advance. And as I think we said before, I think the main thing with this is. You know, it's easy. Once you've made them, you just have to carry them over and, and, and make sure they don't, you know, just collapse in whatever um, storage or conveyance you've got them in. But but also just from a like sales point of view is the theatrics of how you finish them off on the stall. Um, and, I, and there is obviously the element of if it's cold, people don't really want to eat a cold slice of something like it would be really nice to find a way to warm something up. And that might be as simple as pouring warm you know salted caramel sauce on top of it or whatever but there's 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 things it's going to be very much a finishing off on site kind of um business i mean it's, it's all going to be already made but like it's just like what flourishes can you do on site to kind of like lift to lift it so it's not just sitting there a little bit passive um which is often yeah. the with cake stalls isn't it there's just, like there's no theater you're just everything's yeah. been made and you're just standing there and like you just hand it over there has to be some kind of bringing it to life again, I think. The blow was in your, uh, That's the blowtorch. The, those things are amazing. Yeah, I, I, I travel across town just to watch a blowtorch in operation. <laughs> amazing. Hey, wasn't your uh, your equipment of choice uh, like a baby milk warmer? Yeah. And so for the bottles of sauce, you would just have that in the... And it yeah. would just be kept at like, a good temperature. Oh, my God. Genius. I used to boil a cutting hob and pot at Q just to warm sauce. It's right. brilliant. Um, it's brilliant, but it's a liability. If you pull out the, the um, sauce bottle when it's really, really hot, and then you, like I used to do, like to pour the sauce in front of the customer, the velocity of the heat going out would, uh, there was quite, there were quite a few accidents. I remember this woman once, she was all dressed in white. She had like white t-shirt and white jeans, and there was this like terrible hot uh, chocolate fudge sauce incident where it just kind of 
showered her. She was she was quite. I think she was drunk. I think it was all right. But yeah, it was um, it's pretty bad. You have to kind of learn how to control the the sauce bottle. Yeah. Um, on, on the first side, if people need to heat up their bottles to feed their babies, you know, they can come to you. Yeah, we used to do that as well. That was that was an option for sure. Um, okay, so let's go on to Sarah. Oh, uh, oh, be before you do, go, um, I should take down the line of food processor, uh, Cater Quick. Now, I love Cater Quick. I've bought bunches of equipment from them. They're great. Um, if I was going to buy a food processor, I would go large and get a RoboCoop because you, you get what you pay for with that sort of thing. Joel, Joel get covered that in this video. There we go. I mean, you don't want anything with a bowl because a bowl, you have to keep on taking the bowl out, emptying it, putting the blade in, trying not to shear your fingers, you know, those... I mean, yeah, those, those, I don't know what it, what the model number is, R500 or something, but they're just workhorses. I mean, I've had one for 20 years and it just keeps on going. So, yeah, spend the money, get it. You'll never, ever look back. Yeah, and refer back to the Joel video because there is a big special mention for that uh, in there, isn't there? Um, okay, let's go on to Seb and Cara Jessica who have got uh, Tanio Pizza. So this is going to be a pizza business, which is kind of um, presenting things that people might find um, difficult to um, normally choose, like bone marrow. They were talking about, you know, like a black act, oh, yeah. gal type of um, situation with some really interesting toppings on their pizzas. Wow, this nice. looks, this looks very well researched, and I know, and they've already bought most of it. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's they great. seem to go. Very scalable. You, you just get more pizza ovens as you need more demand. I will, I will uh, just highlight the thing they haven't purchased yet, the gastronome rack. Excellent decision. Having that all ordered in front of you where you can just pick the uh, ingredients from is a great idea. So yeah, back to that question you asked me, if there was one thing that changed my business and life and how we went forward, it was a gastronome rack, actually, uh, adding into all the other things. Because yeah, you just what a, when you just designing a store layout and stuff, most people think about the table and what you can do on a table and they don't think vertical. And actually you have all of this vertical space in your stall, whatever your, your stall setup is, that you don't use. Um, and actually it's, you basically double your amount of use, usable space if you can somehow access your vertical space. So going back to this example where I had um, an oven at, at Kew Gardens and underneath it we had a hot cupboard. So it built a special table. So you got the hot cupboard underneath it and the oven on top. So in that one square meter of real estate on the stall, we managed to cook and hot hold pretty much everything for an entire busy service. But we'd only used one meter of table, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, go for it with the gastro racks. I think everybody should get one. It's just like get vertical. them at home. Have them yeah. at home in the kitchen. Put the kids in. Them. Yeah, and there's a discussion of that as well in Joel's video um, to anyone who hasn't, who wonder, who's wondering what we're talking about. Um, listen, I think we should move on to questions because we've got a few questions coming through and some of them are quite meaty. Um, but I hope that, um, I know that some people's homework didn't come in till today, so apologies if we couldn't get to it, but we went with the, the first ones that came through. Um, but I hope that that's given you all an overview of um, what is like roughly involved with getting equipment and that um, for those of you who haven't been mentioned that there's certain things that have rung bells there and you've definitely got a chance to ask a question now if it hasn't rung bells. So let's go on to first question very quickly from Lottie Sheedy. Is there a particular company you'd recommend for signage? We mentioned this um, last week, I think it was, um, which was Fundy signs um, and we put a link in um, so we'll put another link into that but yeah just get in touch with them and I said I thought he'd left London but actually then I realized afterwards it doesn't matter if he's left London he can still make signs for people wherever he is so he's brilliant he was a trader he had Fundy Pizza and now it's Fundy uh, Signs and it's he's doing a really good job with that um, so M Maria McCloskey um, I don't know if this question is better served from the product week blah 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 we've noticed food cost has really increased for takeaways. Would you say this is from COVID, Brexit? Basically wanted to know how we should incorporate all of these changes into our pricing models if we're to launch in the coming weeks. And then there's another part of this question. Should we also be incorporating the equipment costs into the dish along with ingredients and labor we calculated? We just want to make sure we're not pricing ourselves out or also too low. 
Um, wow. I'll go. I'll just tackle the last question first. No, don't put the equipment costs in because the equipment cost counts as like invest. It's called capital expenditure, so you still own that. So if it does depreciate in price eventually, but if you bought a stainless steel table today, you can sell it tomorrow, and you, and it and it will probably actually go up in price because people love stainless steel tables. But you do, yeah, it doesn't essentially cost you money to to keep it. Yeah, I, I can have a crack at the second part of the question, which is what is driving the price increases? Uh, I don't know if it's COVID. I mean, ingredients prices were going up way before COVID started. Just when you know, when the UK voted to leave the EU, things went up 10% overnight. The currency depreciated. Um, I, I think that's going to get worse. I think food's going to get more expensive. Um, I mean, there's an argument that a lot of food's been too cheap too long. Um, but especially if you've got some sort of um, ethical eye on your business and you, you're trying to buy things, you know, well, you know, well husbanded, sustainable, etc. I mean, that, that stuff's not cheap and it's not going to get cheaper, really. Um, so, yes, I would price it in. I mean, the, the flip side of having more expensive things is that people are used to spending more money. Um, you know, you, I wouldn't have spent £8.50 on a burger a few years ago. I mean, but nowadays, it's that that's pretty much mid-range. Um, and I've, anecdotally, friends of mine have gone out trading and are charging 50p more than before, or a pound more than before, because really, they have to. It's the only business they're getting. They used to get you know, work three, four days a week, and now it's three, four days every couple of months with what's popping up and around. And people aren't blinking. They're spending the money. Um, I mean, it, it may depend on what part of the country you're in or what part of the world you're in, but in London, I don't think people are blinking um, at spending a little bit more on food. Um, if anything, I think COVID has had a lot of people not being out for an enormous amount of time, yet still earning the same money which they did before. So I, I don't think putting up your prices is really going to affect it much. But um, I would, yeah. I would just add to that, look at your individual products and work out what gives you a good product margin. So like what actually you can make uh, a couple of quid on. I would also say that probably the reason that takeaways have gone up so much is probably delivery fees of 30%. So people don't want to pay, don't want to lose all that money. Yeah, delivery yeah. is like an anagram for devil roof. Oh, Christ, don't get me started. <laughs> go on, go for it. Let's hear it. No, it's just, I mean, anything that's got, it's got the word devil in it, God's sake. Um, at 35% and holding people to, you know, to ransom like that, it, I find it shocking. Um, but yeah, it's the way we've, society has kind of um, evolved. But on that point, um, lockdown produced a lot of innovation. Um, we, we started doing takeaway slash delivery pay from a, the driveway of a friend of mine here in Kilburn. And we thought we might do 30, 40 covers and in a day just to keep my staff working and we ended up doing you know averaging like 200 250 um but we built our own delivery system mainly to to advice from ollie and based on Airtable, zapier and a product called jot form because i didn't like the Airtable forms um it took a week to finesse it properly but we had an ordering system that worked um and i had delivery guys and it ended up costing me eight percent to deliver rather than 35 percent um and we were busy enough um so I'm not sure if you need to set out. No, sorry, not set out. Very poor choice of words. I'm not sure if you need to be so reliant on these delivery platforms. Thirty-five percent is ridiculous. <laughs> I would. I one my one of my tips for the future as well is uh, doing more regional markets. Like I see uh, original fryer material who used to be in London, going around like Winchester and places like that, and even like small towns in the outskirts are there. And he's always sold out. He's like, it's all booked, pre-booked in advance. And he, and he just turns up, makes loads of burgers that people have already paid for, and then moves on. Yeah, it's really thinking about where the people are going to be and realizing that you're, you're, the benefit of you being mobile is that you can go and find them. Like, it's, it's brilliant. You've just got to be able to be flexible enough to just get up and go and go out to the regions, go out to the neighborhoods, wherever it is, because it, it ain't in central London at the moment. So it's just, um, you know, being aware of your own mobility in all of this. Um, Create a WhatsApp group for each town. Just send them a message when you're on your way. Man, one influencer out in the countryside and that's it. I mean, that's, that's a good day's work paid for. Just on the actual, um, like, accounting side of the numbers behind it. I think if you keep looking at your costs versus what you're charging, et cetera, I always worked on the magic thing of my, my ingredients costs shouldn't be more than 25% of my 
sale price. Um, I know restaurants work on a different ratio, but you know, they, they work differently. Because at 25% or ideally even 20%, you've got a bit more margin to play with with staff and travel time and this and that and the other. So because if you if you go to a market somewhere and you take 1,500 quid, you really want to be putting five, 600 quid in your pocket at the end of the day. Because you, you know there's the day's work beforehand, there's all the stuff afterwards, you know, it, it, you know that day, day rate comes down pretty quickly. So um, in, if you feel that you're charging too much based on your ingredients cost, then you probably are. Uh, but again, I guess uh, straight to Marissa, you, you should think, does that seem fair for what I'm serving? And even if you think it's too much money, but it still seems fair, boom, go for it. I mean, people pay eight for fifty for a you know plate of mac and cheese, which can be made for eighty-five p. But it seems fair on the street, so why not? Who are we to judge? Somebody said something to me once, which has always struck stuck with me, which is that people will bulk at paying eight pounds fifty or ten pounds for a burger, which has come from some beautiful herd potentially with some beautiful well-crafted bun and all the lovely ingredients but no one thinks twice about spending the same amount on a double gin and tonic um and it's and it's ridiculous like we don't think anything of spending money on cocktails or, or nice drinks and actually their margins are brilliant compared to actual the actual margins of this wonderful food that is expected to be super cheap and super ethical all at the same time and pay people well. It's a it's a tricky um cross to be in. Um Pete, and people buy bottled water. People yeah. spend a quid on something that they can get in any building for free. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the value proposition and working out what yours is. Um, okay, so another question. Will Wyatt, hi Will, what is the best way to find staff? So I did talk about this last week in um, Operations Week and mentioned a few places that are um, really good to go to for staff. So one of them is Slinger, um, which is operating out of London and it started off as a Facebook group and it was Theo who used to work with Curb, um, who just set up this Facebook group because people were always asking, where do I get staff and where do I get gigs? Because they could see all these people working behind stools and and he put them together and, and has basically built out this incredible looking app which really um, calls, like individualizes all the, the temporary staff. I mean, Ollie, you can probably explain it better than me. Yeah, it's like an agency, but a lot nicer than an agency. And the people on it are generally like a really good level. Right. And it's and it's very convenient. So if you're in London, go for that. It, they are going to expand, like I said, beyond London, but they're not at the moment. They're in pretty early stages. Um, Counter Talk is, again, another really great platform, which is all about making life working in the hospitality industry more enjoyable and more empowered. We've got Ravneet Gill, who's the founder of it, on next week um, for People Week on Night Class. So um, she'll be able to answer some of those questions. But it's a really great resource for people looking for work in the hospitality industry. So as a business owner, it'll be a really good place for you to go and find people who are looking. And it's all about transparency and fair pay and everything like that, which leads on to the other question from Will, which is also how much would you pay the staff? Um, I can answer that uh, more than you think, basically. Um, there's people out there advertising saying they're paying the London living wage and this and that and the other. I mean, the London living wage is for people who do a basic job for basic hours and then say thank you very much and go home. Um, and your staff, especially if you're on a, a busy street food store, um, they need to be entertainers, they need to be cleaners, they need to be uh, to listen to you while you're crying, they need to be loading, they need to be unloading and so on and so forth. You paying If you're paying these people £10 an hour, that, that's basically saying that they're dispensable. Um, and if you can get staff through different platforms and stuff where you paying the platform money, but the staff members end up with less money, you know, I, I wouldn't be paying less than £11 an hour in the hand to the people who are working because you, more, 11 50 because you, you also don't want them leaving when a better offer comes along, just when they're trained up enough and they get your vibe and, um, you know, the front of your store is the most important part, the person who's meeting the customer they, they're selling your product. You know, people will always return to a friendly face. I mean, Starbucks tried it by writing your name on a cup. I mean, that, that's like 30% of the way there. 
you know, when there's somebody who makes eye contact with you and still goes, hey, dude, how are you doing, man? Haven't seen you since last week. What, you're having the same as not, you know, boom. You, I, I don't care what they're setting. I'm coming back every week for that food. Um, you can't pay them £10 an hour because the second they get off at 11.50, they're gone, you know, unless you're, you're married to them or they're your child and they're forced to work for you. Not like mine. They're too young. But, like, if, if you're paying £12 an hour, then that person's coming to work, you know, Um and also, I would avoid saying, okay, it's a four-hour day just to save you a bit of money. That's, that's bollocks, especially in London, you know, with travel time and that sort of thing. Like, it, I always believe that somebody needs to be earning a minimum 60 quid for even if it's a four- or five-hour shift because, it, you know, they can't get other work that day. So what you're paying them has got to make it worthwhile for their entire day. You may think, well, it's only a few hours' work. I'm not going to pay you this. But unless they can get a, a double in, you know, work with you some bit and then go somewhere else afterwards or before or something. It's very difficult with lunchtime markets because it's, you know, it's most of the day is gone. Um, so I would be thinking what, as a staff member, what would I want for the job um, and pay them accordingly. And within a couple of weeks, you'll know if they're taking the piss or not because you can always say, this is a good job. It's good money. You're not putting your weights. Goodbye. Does that cover it? I hope. Yeah, but but Nick, just to say that you know what one of the successes of your business is you've always had um, a solid team, and you've always it's because you've always paid people well and you've looked after them. And we talk about this in People Week that's coming up, but just you know you pay people well so they stick around, which helps massively. No matter how much you're um, you know making them feel part of something, making them feel loved and cherished, like you also pay them well at the end of the day, and it's. It's very tempting to think because it's kind of casual work, a lot of it, and transient and everything that you don't need to pay a lot. If you're going to pay less, you better be doing like offering a whole load of other benefits too. Sure, or massive hours. I get it. If somebody's working 12 hours and you've worked out that that's 120 quid for the day, because it's and you know there's some downtime and this and blah blah blah. I mean, you can have that conversation. Um, but I think the main thing that, would, from my opinion, should be in people's minds is. How much money is coming over the, the, the front of the counter because whoever's on the till if they're seeing you take two and a half grand in a busy service and they're getting 60 quid from it you know they know how much you're making or they think they know how much you're making which is even more dangerous so you kind of need to pay them accordingly so they don't just go slower or not pitch up the next time because they're the most important person everybody in your store is the most important person there really i think that's what it comes down to i personally i would just have less staff and pay them better Let's have them working harder. You know, you pay somebody 15 quid an hour, but they don't breathe for four hours. I mean, you know, it's, I think it's a pretty fair payoff. Not you mean, sure that, in a, good, you mean that in a good way, don't you? <laughs> like that they're yeah, working it's not, hard. Yeah, it's not because you've got their head underwater, no. But, uh, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're working hard, working fast. I mean, most of the people I've been privileged to work with enjoy hard work and fast work. You, know, you get a bit of an endorphin rush out of it as well. Um, you know, nobody really wants to be standing around checking, you know, Instagram all the time. I don't yeah. Know. And it's a bad look. No one wants to be looking at somebody in a store who's checking Instagram because you're not going to go up to that store. And, and it happens too often. And, and it's a problem, you know, with um, markets that aren't busy. Like you see, like people get bored. Um, so I agree to be able to have a leaner team who also are operating within really good systems whereby when it's busy, they can, you know, make it really, really work for them and you is the way to go if you can figure that out. Um, okay, and I think we've got time for one final question. So this is from Minosh Kok. Good evening. Hi, Minosh. Any questions for gas engineers, any suggestions for gas engineers and gas safety certificates? I think it depends uh, where you are. Yeah. If I you're mean, based you, Sorry, you go you, first? All right. You know, you go. You know more about this than I do. Um, well, I'm, I'm West London, North West London based. So I've always used guys based out here. I mean, if you're anywhere in West or North West London, I'd, I'd use a company called DPS. Uh, they're in Neasden, NW10. Not that cheap, uh, but they do the job properly. You know, and if there's something wrong with your equipment, they tell you and they sort it out. They don't just rubber stamp it and then you go and you know, kill several people at an event. Um, I don't know about the guys out east, but um, I think if you have access to to the Curb Slack channel, they, I mean, everybody has a pet gas engineer on there. Um, but again, it depends where you are around the country. Um, and, and also within one or two chats with people who've used them, you, you'll have found out whether they're any good or not. Roughly how much should you be paying for each certificate? DPS, I think, charge 25 quid per piece of equipment, per, you know, per piece of kit. Um, but then a call-out fee or something. 
No, you well, it's just better you take the stuff to them. If you're waiting right. on people to come to you, things go wrong. You can always it's always you can always negotiate when you take things to people as well. I mean, if you've got it all in a, your van, yeah, it's better. I think there's a big range of how much people are paying for stuff. I've heard people paying 150 for a certificate some places. They, I think yeah. how much tech, how much equipment they're testing. I mean, if they're doing a a flame failure device check, that takes a while, you know, in in a proper environment setup. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've I've had gas checks done in, in very very strange places. Um, I found it easiest overall to maybe spend a bit more time, effort, and money and go to the place where they have everything set up and it can be done properly and quickly, and then that doesn't piss them off too much. And then you know, next time around, you can negotiate a bit of a cut, you know, cutting the fee and stuff, because um, they okay. change the rules now. It has to be every six months, not every year, which is annoying. Minos is in London, so I'll just give him two more names. There's N4 Gas. They're up in uh, North London. And then in South London, there's Johnny's DIY in Deptford. I think there's a guy there called Neville who does gas certificates for, like, the whole of the street food industry. Yeah, I've heard of Neville. There's a guy out east as well, Peter, someone. Peter uh, Hutchinson. That's him, yeah. There we go. <laughs> there, yeah, that's the whole of London. <laughs> There's a lot of names there. Um, any links we have, we will we'll, we will give you, but definitely just look them up um, either, um, or if not. And um, remember that the Slack channel, um, the Slack trader group is going to be available to all of you once you finish this course. And there'll be a whole world of information that hopefully this course will have prepared you for being able to absorb. Um, we're going to end it there. Go on, Nick. Sorry, just one quick, one more thing. Re regarding gas equipment and stuff, the, the biggest bane in most traders' life when you're setting up in a gazebo is gas piping. So get the gas engineer to do it for you, to design you a layout that runs around the outside of your stall. And things just plug into it nicely. Um, spend the money once. It'll save you a lot of time and hassle, et cetera, later on. So do your store layout and pay the professionals to do it. Um, just easier. And make friends with them. And we're going to talk about this more in People Week, but just really thinking about your suppliers as part of your team and them being able to really help you grow. The better the relationship you have with them, the more you're going to be able to ask them to do to help you out and the more they're going to be willing to help you out. So think about that as you read through People Week. Um, Ollie, any parting comments? Um... Don't be a dick. That's the that seems to be the mantra of everyone on the street. Just be nice to people and you'll get you'll go far. Sure thing. It's very true. <laughs> don't don't be a dick. Don't gossip. And uh keep your powder dry. Nick. Yeah, look, I mean, that, that goes without saying. I, I, in just focusing on the equipment side, I would say whatever you decide you want at the beginning, whatever layout you're going to choose, it, it's all going to change. Um, don't be afraid of changing it. Don't be afraid of looking at it and going, this isn't working out. Don't think, oh, but I've spent all this money and I have to make it work. You do have to make it work, but it doesn't have to be phase one, phase two. I mean, everything takes iterations to develop. I mean, I, I couldn't. I'll show you pictures of my first stall back in 2005 and what it looks like now. And you're like, Christ, it's like it's gone from a developing country, you know, to, to being very much a first world place. So, yeah, don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to take stuff out. Don't be afraid to admit that you were wrong because you probably are wrong. I mean, the number of times that I've been wrong in the past 15 whatever years is seriously outweigh the number of times I've been right. But I think the difference was is I wasn't afraid to go. I was wrong. Um, and, yeah, also apologize for that. Um, people love it when you apologize. Um, I don't just mean organizers, I mean customers, etc. If somebody's been waiting 20 minutes for food, you apologize and you give it to them for free and you've got a customer for life. You know? Yeah, yeah. It all comes down to um, acknowledging people and hearing them, which is like the whole mantra of all of this, right? Let people feel heard, seen, and they'll be devoted to you. Um, and also, yeah, just um, keep that whole that whole thing in mind of rigidity, like the more rigid you are, the less progress you're going to make. So be willing to acknowledge yourself and your mistakes that you're making yourself. And don't be too wedded, like you said, Nick, to, oh, well, I've done that now, then this is the way I've got to continue, because those are not, not the businesses that do well. 
it's the ones that go, oh shit, I have spent some money on this, but I'm gonna go and make the one that's gonna be more successful because I need to be more successful and just rolling with it and being a bit fluid about it. So thank you very much, both of you, for all of your insight and your input. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. I hope that this has been useful. You might have to watch this more than once. Um, just like the Joel video, you might wanna watch more than once. Some of you might just be obsessed with the video. I think it's brilliant. Um, and I think any operational person will, will love it too. So I hope you've enjoyed Operations Week and I hope you're looking forward to People Week, which is really, yes, talking about your team and all the iterations of what your team are and involve and how to keep them close and happy and representing your company in the best way that is possible. So thanks everyone for tuning in and um, we will see you next Friday for People Week Night Class with Ravneet Gill. Thanks a lot, bye. Bye. bye.